All right. Um, well, I'm Holly. I'm the co-president of Wild Ones and my presentation and my business is actually a product of my Wild Ones membership. Um, when I started with Wild Ones, I didn't know what any of these plants or any of these species of pollinators were. Um, and it's been a long and fun journey uh, learning about everything as I planted them and as I watched everything come to my garden and as I learned uh, by going to different parks and natural areas and restorations um, near and far and it's been a lot of fun. And this business actually started um, by taking a lot of these photographs, um, just spending a lot of time out in my yard and paying attention to what was happening with the plants. I have a really um, sandy, uh, dry yard and not a lot of things that were traditional that my mother grew in Buffalo, New York. None of those that I tried planting grew <laughs> in my yard. And um, it, it was an experiment that took a long time to figure out that I actually have things that uh, I have conditions that support a lot of the native prairie and oak savanna species, and I didn't know that at the time. So after a lot of failure, I figured out a lot of things that do grow and some things that surprisingly grew despite my conditions like New England aster. And that's been the fun of native plants. Um, but in the process of just gardening and paying attention to it, I started taking pictures and um, the idea for a hobby turned into a business came out of that. Um, as I started collecting um, hundreds, soon to be thousands of photographs that I originally intended to just be studies that I would draw from and get back into doing traditional artwork. And I just, basically stalked every butterfly and bee and dragonfly and any, any other critter that came in um, in my view around all the things that I planted. And uh, I just wanna share quickly a couple of my favorite photographs from the early days when I started this, like the iconic monarch on swamp milkweed um, and the caterpillar. And, uh, the monarch caterpillar on butterfly weed. And this was like one of the, the first butterfly weeds that I had success with. And it was actually growing out over the, the street. So it's growing out over the curb. And so the background you're seeing is actual pavement. And I just thought it was kind of a neat photograph because the background was so null and it, the focus is on this caterpillar and I was just fascinated that it was on the flower and not the leaf and I got caught up in all the details of what was going on with all these critters and I couldn't stop taking pictures of them. Um, by far the most pictures I've taken have been of bumblebees because that's what I definitely get the most of and I know most of them are the common bumblebee, our bombus species, um, but I, I love them because they stay put a little bit more than some of the other species and they visit a wide variety of the flowers that I've planted. Um, but the, I'm kind of chasing some of the harder to get species like the green sweat bee that don't stay as long on any one flower. So it's really rare that um, my slow camera can capture um, some of the nuances of what they're doing when they do stop. Um, but I'm not limited to just the butterflies and the bumblebees. Uh, some of the species that don't get as much regard, like the surfid fly, which are also important pollinators, have been fun to watch. And, and the delicateness of how they go about what they do is, is really interesting. And, and I find the spring plants, like wild geranium, are really good showcases for what they do because they give you the really good contrast to see what's actually happening. Um, but I have to admit, I do have a favorite, and it's the great black wasp. It is not um, on everybody's favorites list, but I'm fascinated by it. 
It, visited, it visits a couple of flowers I have growing. This one's Virginia Mountain Mint, um, also Monarda punctata, uh, Spotted Horse Mint. It likes a lot of the white flowers, but it, when the wings, the, the blue-black wings of this um, insect catch the sun, it's just, there's nothing like it. And I've been chasing them in my yard for now a couple years. Um, this is the photo that actually started the idea for my business. Um, I had planted this and this was the first year that it came up after I'd planted just a little seedling and it was a rattlesnake master and I, I'd never had one. I didn't know what it would do. And it was the first plant to really come up in a, in a northern rain garden um, that was mostly shaded. So I wasn't, I didn't have high hopes and it came up and it was in this beautiful delicate Kit bloom when this uh, autumn meadowhawk dragonfly just perched on it and sat there for like three minutes and I uh, enough time for me to run into the house and get my camera and come back out to take probably a couple hundred pictures of it and it was the the first photo I took that really got me started on thinking about doing this as something more than just my own little personal hobby because it made me think about why I, I'm doing this, why I'm planting these things, and this is why. Um, it's not just for the pollinators, not just for the perchers, um, but it's to have those interactions, to bring that nature a little closer in where I can see it and be around it and invite it home, in Talamese words. Um, and the variety of species that have come in have been um, amazing to watch and you start to see patterns um, like this eastern tiger swallowtail butterfly um, it, it, it came to several flowers but it kept coming back to this newly blooming jo spotted joe pie weed and it that seemed to be its favorite and the, you'll observe over time the different species having different favorites and I've, I've learned how to, to do stakeouts of certain places, certain flowers, certain times of day to see what's coming where. And the whole idea of garden variety art is to take those images and put them onto things that could be useful, to make pretty useful things. Um, I originally was thinking of a more traditional art business when I started out and um, doing prints that you could frame and put on a wall. And then I had the, the fortune of taking a class at the Arboretum with um, Dan Fenner from uh, a photography group doing dye sublimation. And he turned me on to the process of printing with a special printer and using a heat press where you can take any, any photograph or any image that you make and transfer it onto um, certain substrates that have a polyester coating or a polyester fabric. And you can get the photographic um, intensity of the image without having to do a, a more traditional print process or screen printing or anything. And it becomes part of the surface of the object. And that was really um, interesting to me and I, I loved the effect of it. And I started, I, I bought the equipment and I started experimenting on everything from garden signs to coasters to fabric and taking all my favorite images and trying to do something fun with them. And that was the start of the actual business part of this adventure. Um, I've done a variety of coasters. I have some in glass, um, but I recently started doing uh, ceramic coasters. So I have a whole variety of, of those. Um, just to, again, show the, 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 not just the variety of the plants, but the variety of the species that come to those plants. And, and that's been the emphasis for me is those interactions. And some of the, my photographs are about the, not just the diversity of the interactions, but the plentitude of them. And one of my favorite plants that I've been growing is cup plant. And this was one of the many days when they were newly bloomed and there was literally a bumblebee on every single flower for most of the day. And um, I was just so amazed by it that I had to do more with that photograph. 
And so I turned it into puzzle coasters where you can have it sitting on your table and looking just like a, a very pretty picture, but then when you need a coaster, you just grab a piece of it. Or a puzzle magnet that goes on your fridge that has 30 pieces, so that's 30 individual magnets. You can pull out a piece and hold something up on your refrigerator and, and get the whole, the whole picture when you put it together. And I have experimented with pot holders. I'm working on dish towels and bag tags, and I'll just I'm trying to to figure out what how many different kinds of useful things um, that we use every day could have images that are um, inspiring to me for the habitat gardening theme for what I'm interested in as a photographer and an artist, what people would like to invite into their home, not just for the images on my objects, but maybe to think about doing a little bit of the gardening that brings these things actually into their homescapes. Um, I've done magnets. There's an amazing product, a Chroma, Chroma Lux aluminum panels. They're um, made in the USA, recycled aluminum, and they have a beautiful, um, gloss finish. They're, they're, they're more vibrant than any photograph you would print on paper. And I put some magnets on the back of them and, and it's a gorgeous everyday art piece that you can have in any room that you've got a metal surface on. Um, I just started doing some glass ornaments so you can actually see the light comes through the, the images to try to bring a little sparkle because not every Thing has to be useful some things can just be pretty too and we, we can enjoy them both in our gardens and in our homes um, started working with jewelry there's a line of natural shell jewelry that take the images in a completely different way and um, you can wear your favorite butterfly or your favorite bumblebee and aluminum ornaments that are two-sided that will spin from an open monarch to a closed monarch as it, it sits either on or hangs on your tree or uh, on any hook anywhere in the sun catches the sun um it was an interesting year i started this business in February for the Design with Nature conference. And then of course COVID hit and everything that I had scheduled for um, pretty much spring, summer and fall got canceled. And in the downtime of the summer, um, I, uh, masks were made available to me that I could use the dye sublimation process on. And so I'm like, well, why not? I decided to have a little fun with it and retooled what I was doing and figured if we need to wear masks, then we might as well have a little bit of fun. And I wanted to share my obsession um, of native plants and pollinators. And so I, I did a whole series of, of masks that, that have my photographs and some, I think, kind of fun cheeky sayings on them just to make it lighter. Um, but in the process, I also start, my, my goal was always to start working beyond the photographs. The photographs were a, a start to the project. And one of the first things I finished was working on patterns. And so inspired by the photographs, I started working on um, pattern design and working digitally um, which were supposed to be just ideas for doing ink drawings, but I really liked how they were turning out. So I started doing digital graphic design and um, started doing elements like this. Um, um, the, the large one was what I initially designed as just the initial element and then started working with pattern making and using Adobe Illustrator, um, working with how to make repeat patterns and move things around and switch things around and make something that looks dynamic um, if you were going to use it on fabric or on paper. And I, with this particular design, I was shooting for a loose lattice uh, design. So if you kind of step away, I'm hoping it looks a little bit like a lattice without actually connecting. 
Um, but at the start was always the photographs. So I had photographs that I kept looking at um, that inspired uh, that artistic thinking. And one of my all time favorite photographs of, of this bumblebee at uh, Wild Bergamot um, was, also, was one of my go-tos for thinking about how to think about not just how pretty something looks, but how useful something is. And not just to me, but to um, the, the wider ecosystem I'm, I'm trying to create. Um, by far the most popular of my designs so far has been the monarch butterfly. And the, um, this was the pattern that I created from that. And with this one, I was going for a, a loose uh, herringbone pattern. So I was trying to use the wing direction and the leaf direction to, by switching things around to kind of create that sense, sense of motion going back and forth. And I thought that would be fun for, for a wallpaper or a textile pattern. Um, and those were the two of the photos that inspired that. I had a couple more, but those were the main ones. And then I had the opportunity to do um, a three layer mask that was reversible. So I could actually print both sides of it. And so I decided that was a good opportunity to use the photos on one side and the patterns on the other to make something that was fun and you could wear either way. So if you felt like the photograph out one day, you could wear that and you could wear the pattern out the other day. And either way, you're helping promote um, habitat gardening, whether people recognize it or not, the more they get to see it, the more it'll, it'll register with people. And um, the monarch has been the most popular, but I keep rooting for the bumblebee because it, it needs a little, a little praising. It does a lot for us. Um, and just as a little closing message, a little quote, the essence of the beautiful is unity and variety. And I'm, while I've been working really hard on a native plant garden, I'm also open to the fact that it's a garden. And this is um, Mexican sunflower. It's an annual, but it's one that I, I love to plant in, especially in the barrels and pots in my gardens. And it accents the natives beautifully and draws everyone in, especially the monarchs and the bumblebees. Um, but I'm a firm believer in more is more. <laughs> and and uh, there are certain things that we can add to our native perennials um, to, to give a little extra value added. And I've gotten a few questions about my logo. What, what's up with the flamingo? And the flamingo is important to me. I, my background is I'm an academic. I've studied the history, the cultural history of suburbia for many, many years and more years than I've been in wild ones. And so that's been close to my heart for, for that reason, because the, the plastic pink, pink flamingo is the quote unquote, the native bird of suburbia. But to me, it's a symbol and a reminder that what I'm doing in my yard is gardening. It, it is a man-made cultivated landscape. As much as I love the natural areas around me and the restorations and the acres and acres of native native restoration and preserves. Um, what I am doing in my yard is a garden and it, it, even if it's filled with native plants, it's still a garden. And the pink flamingo reminds me of that. But it also reminds me that I have the power to add those things, to add the things that add ecosystem value to my garden, to my yard, and invite nature in and make it part of my home. And that's why it's in my logo. And hopefully I'll expand my logo so there's other things in it too. But for now, th that's my reminder. And that's my presentation. Thank you.